Okay, so I'm here with Chris Dockle. He's a filmmaker behind um, a film that got in competition in London, The Island of Dr. Moran. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. Lovely yeah. for you to, uh, wonderful for you, for you joining us. Um, yeah, if you could tell us about this film, and I should put, I mean, this is, as you know, my, my film is a very unusual, a, a great um, idea that you come up with to highlight what, well, it's a stage show, but yeah, anyway, I'm interrupting you, please do tell us. Well, basically the story, um, follows um, the adventures of Edwina and Dougie. And through them, we spend a night on the island of Dr. Moron. Edwina and Dougie are washed ashore, their ship, the crew, all their friends gone, and uh, they wake up uh, washed up on a beach on the island of Dr. Moron. They're captured by voodoo natives, uh, led by Voodoo Valma, <laughs> who calls herself the voodoo queen, what's bad and mean. and. Uh, almost cooked in a cauldron as a voodoo sacrifice. Mm. But then uh, Voodoo Valma gets the idea that, hey, wait on, there's a rich mad doctor on the island who's always looking for experimental subjects. Maybe we could sell this young couple to him. So they set up a slave market auction uh, just for these two to be sold to Dr. Moron. Dr. Moron, of course, is sucked in, loves the idea of buying them, buys them and then takes them back to his laboratory at Devil's Cove on the other side of the island where he plans to do all sorts of terrible things to them. And, and we should point out what's the, the uniqueness of this is it's a filmed stay show, isn't it? Yes. Which is very, very unusual. And I know it's very unusual for all sorts of reasons. But can you explain why you decided to... I mean, I know why you decided, but you know, what the, who came up with the concept of actually filming this? Well, our plan right from the start was... Um, to launch the island of Dr. Moron as a live rock musical. Yeah. And we did it um, really defying the traditional uh, paradigm by which people launch live musicals in Australia. Um, we raised money privately from a whole lot of supporters and sponsors. We leased a disused cinema and converted it uh, into a live theatre. And then we launched Dr. Moron there in late 2014. We knew with a cast of 35 and a crew of 50 that we could not afford to underwrite that show for more than four weeks safely. Yeah. And I'm pretty conservative in the way I approach things. I wanted to make sure that we had enough money in the kitty to pay every member of our, our cast and crew for four weeks of performance, plus all the rehearsals, if not one person came through the door. As it turned out, we started in week one with 40% ticket sales, and in, by week four, we were completely sold out. It's brilliant. And I, I was perched on a stool on the last night next to our sound mixer because I couldn't get a seat in my own house. But was I complaining? No. Um, but because we knew we only had four weeks... So you couldn't have... Whatever happened, you could not extend... I suppose because well, you, you booked it and yeah. that was the end of it. Well, that's right. You, you sign the um, actors up to a contract. Yeah. Um, within two weeks of the show, half of our ensemble were performing overseas. Right. They're all professionals. Yeah, of course, they've got to work. You know, a lot of the guys have actually been in films like Superman and Son of, Ma Son of Mask and Sanctum and stuff like that. So they were contracted out for other things as well. And that's the way it happens. Yeah. That's the way it always happens with all sort of live shows. So we knew we only had four weeks to prove the worth of the live show, which we did. But we always planned to make a film of the live show to take to the world to show potential investors in the next live production just what we're talking about. So we're not talking an idea, we're talking a reality. Uh, as it turned out, because we were able to control the space that we leased, which again is very different from the way you would normally mount a production. Normally you would lease a theatre for four and a half weeks, which gives you bump in, bump out time, a tech rehearsal and yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had this place for six months. So it was basically became our studio for the film as well. So we could put cameras anywhere and everywhere we wanted to. So we ended up with 14 cameras per shoot um, a lot of them fixed, and we kept moving the, the positions around from night to night, and some of the cameras were operated by human beings. And so we did that over about 10 of the shows over the month, which then gave us an enormous amount of footage, as you can appreciate. Yeah, but I always think have too much rather than too little, that's the thing, isn't That's it? right, because you can't, that's the thing, with a live show, you can't go back into no. the studio and say, oh, let's shoot that, that cup of tea scene again. And so, um, so we ended up with, as I say, 10 shows worth. And that also gave us 10 shows of 
the digital audio because every show we recorded straight off the desk. And because um, it's fully 5.1, we should point out this. It's, that's it's, right. It's a proper. That's it's, without denigrating. It's a proper film, isn't it? That, it's know. a cinematic film. Cinematic, cinematic that's right. film. Yeah. And we were able to do that because because it was a live show. Um, all of the main performers and singers had their own mics. They had their own channels. Mm. And so from a mixing, and all the instruments were, each instrument was individually mic'd as well. So we, we basically had a recording studio up there on the stage. So 10 shows worth of footage, 10 shows worth of sound. And it's funny, in work, lots of 10. In 2015, 10 months in the editing suite. And, it, and they were long days. I oh, know, it's, um, I know. Really long days. It's, sorry, it's worth pointing out to, to, to newbies that um, the editing process from whether it's a, a 10 minute, end up a 10 minute short or a two and a half hour film, it is a very, very difficult process, a very long time consuming process. You have to be so patient. Yeah. And also you, you, you don't lower the bar you, uh, in terms of standard. Yeah. You just keep going until you get it right. And, in, and anyway, so uh, after 10 months, we ended up with the film that you guys have seen and, and it's now here in London. And uh, we launched it 200 metres from the Sydney Opera House at the, one of the most prestigious cinemas in Australia called Dendi Opera Keys. Um, we took the 150 seater, um, which is like the medium sized cinema. And um, to our delight, the, the, the premiere of the movie sold out two weeks in advance. And so, and we, we we just enjoyed an amazing ride of success around Australia. We've done five of the eight states and territories in Australia. Um, we've been in some of the, the biggest and best venues. And we've also taken the film to some of the smallest country halls, because we also, we invested in a, a massive mobile cinema. So we can take um, a massive screen and, and a sound system that blows your socks off and we've, we've screened in the, the cutest little places in Australia. You know, and we're, we're doing it for people who would normally never get to Sydney or Melbourne or wherever and, and actually get to experience a live show. Because as you know, I, I know what it's, you know, That's right. to people who haven't been to the country, you cannot explain to someone the distances between places. It's no, just astronomical. Really. When Australians say it's just over the hill, it could be a couple of hundred exactly, miles Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is me, like, it's a long way, but of course, to Australia, you know, <laughs> this, is, this seems to be no big deal. That's when right. I bought to drive down from Perth, under 400 k's or whatever it was, and the people that I was like, well, and, you know, it seems around the <laughs> yeah, corner to yeah, them. that's right. Which seems a blooming long way. But yeah. um, and off camera, you, you, we were talking about the genesis for this, and the start of this is actually from a high school musical, I believe, isn't it? That's right. And where did, how did you fit into this? Where did you come in? Are you in from the beginning, and how did it expand? I was in on the beginning. Um, I, in another life, um, I was an English and drama head teacher yeah. uh, in, in Australia, and um, I've had about six books published, numerous plays. I'm actually, at the moment, I've got three plays being translated into the German, and um, a Swiss companies approached us to market them across the EU. So I don't know whether you guys actually get them or not. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. um, but so I was there in the beginning. Um, this is actually one of five rock musicals that my wife Lynn and I have written. Lynn is the musical genius behind this and she's um, the power very, behind the throne. She's a very patient person because her husband comes up with these crazy ideas. Oh, uh. Yes, Chrissy. Okay, right. Here we go. If only she was here yeah. to, to hear us talking about how wonderful she yeah. is. Um, so, right at the beginning, um, I I came up with the idea of more on on the last night of another uh, rock musical we wrote called Chill, uh, which is all about a guy, an intergalactic property developer called Jimmy Slees, and he's come to basically buy out the Earth. But it was I was standing next to the lighting operator. And I thought, how the hell am I going to come up with something to top this? Because it was a pretty good show. And I, I don't know, it really was a flash. And I, I, I thought about the island of Dr. Moreau yes. and the mutated creatures. It wasn't the story, it was the mutated creatures. And I thought, how awesome would that be to see mutated creatures dancing, like frantically dancing to some driving rock music and I don't know if you remember, but there's, there is one song in Act Two called Genetic Mutation. Right. And if you look at Genetic Mutation, that's the vision that I had. And that, that is the genesis of the island of Dr. Moron. 
Um, people go, oh, is it, is it like a spoof on the island of Dr. Moreau? Nothing like that. No, you just have to lift it and, and change it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, during Act Two, there, um, there is a, a reference to another doctor, and um, this character says, silly, silly man, he had it all wrong. And so, whereas our doctor moron has it all right, he wants to bring out the beast in everybody. Yes, and so it started there as a school musical. We're very lucky that uh, we live in a, a valley of really creative people. It's like, if you like, it's like a Big Sur, of, you know, the American Big Sur. Of, of like really, like we're just lucky. We've just got this gold mine of musicians, especially musicians. So um, every show that I did as a school musical was always a hybrid show where I used professional musicians to drive a school show. Um, and so we wrote the songs, um, most of the songs that appear in the film mm. um, for that school show. That school show went for five, five nights. We had adults coming back four times in five nights. And that's when I thought, this is a gold mine. Oh, right. this, that was going to be my next question. When was the point that you and reached? That, so I thought, I knew that Dr. Moron had an appeal, but when I saw that, like the adults coming back, mind you, our, our demographic is at the moment five to 96 years old that we know of. Mm. Um, but I knew that this show had legs. So I parked it, kept it until I got to a point where I thought I must retire from teaching because this is going to be a five to 10 year project. Yeah. And it is, is it, you yeah. ask anybody yeah, who oh, yeah. tries to get a musical up. Um, and I retired at a point in my life where I knew I needed a decade of energy, <laughs> you know, to actually see it through. I love teaching. Um, I am so passionate about teaching and especially teaching disadvantaged and indigenous kids. Loved it. It broke my heart in a way to leave it. But I, I really believe yeah. in the island of Dr. Moron. Yeah. Um, on our journey, as I say, um, we've met some amazing people in the industry who also love it, which is really reassuring. To get here to London because of you guys um, is so reassuring for us. I mean, we are really humbled and proud that we're part of your organisation you. here. Yeah. Thank you. And perhaps you ought to give us in this, again, for, for people that won't know this, we've spoken off camera, but what's your next step in terms of pushing this to use a tight old cliche, the next level, because obviously yep. you now want to take this That's internationally. Exactly. Um, the film, um, you were the one of the first, you were the first film festival we threw a hat in to. Right. And we are absolutely stoked that you picked us up. We will continue on the film festival route for a while, uh, but the film, and you've seen it, yeah, yeah. the film is the best thing that we've got to sell the idea of the live show to serious investors. And you are in a really uh, unique position in terms of, because um, I quit questioning you about this. I was like, oh, why hasn't it been done? Why? But of course the penny dropped, it's all to do the rights issues and ownership. And that's the beauty of the project. That it's that's for, exactly right. For, for all intents and purposes, it's yours. Yes. You know, so you can, this is why you have a unique opportunity where having a film, rather because let's be honest, you want people to see the show, I'm sure flying over to Australia or if it was still running or moving the whole project internationally is be impossible. Doing it this way is a fantastic tool. Well, that's right. And look, we've got a, we've got a prospectus that's out there. Yeah. Um, because we are, we're after millions of dollars um, and we're being really generous in our offer, yeah. the way we've structured it. Um, again, really different um, from most arts projects, but we want to put the live show of the island of Dr. Moore on, on in London, probably Vancouver, and probably Las Vegas, in that order. Where it goes after that, we don't know. Um, but, uh, along the way, we've, we've um, actually been joined by a, a fellow from Sydney who's got decades of experience of managing major musicals, like world famous musicals. He fell in love with Moron from the first rehearsal he attended. He said, this has got cult written all over yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, so he's come on board. He's put together a plan that is safe and conservative, yet it's, it's a very achievable plan where we can put Dr. Moron into small to medium theatres in cities with high tourist influxes. We need to attract less than half a percent. We've done our figures, half a percent of tourists into these cities to actually start making money out of it. 
with a cast of 35. Mm. Um, and it's just so doable. But what we need now is that, you know, those people with the money who also can just see it. And we were talking earlier about George Lucas and merchandising. Yeah, yeah. Some people can see that opportunity, you know, whereas all, all the other people around are blinded by tradition mm. and the traditional paradigms. Um, and some people can just see it. So we're, we, we are confident we've got some re we've got really good property, intellectual property in Moron. And we are confident that on our journey, which has just begun, we will meet the personal people who go, yeah, we'll put our money into that because we can smell the money at the other end. And when you look back, when you go back for five, that for all intents and purposes, we'll say five years, five, yeah. from the initial, or we perhaps go back even further, from the initial idea um, of putting on this stage musical to exactly to where you are now. I mean, it's a silly question, really, but I kind of guess you can't believe how this could have transformed into some small idea to run a state to. to you're, so, you're so right, I Steve. Mean, it's, yeah. uh, can you put it into words? Well, I, I, said, I said to Lynn when we, when we actually sat down for our first coffee here in London, I said, What a roller coaster ride, Lenny. Like, who'd have believed? that you know what started in a little hall in Kempsey in yeah. New South Wales in Australia with no other thought other than putting on a new show that that's right and giving, a few people to see. And giving the kids a really good yeah. ride you yeah know? and um, from that from that beginning you know here we are talking in London about a film that's screening in your festival no, so, it's, yeah. it's, I mean yeah. it's, it's unca I guess uncanny yeah. really yeah. but you know I know this is corny but we come from a small community a country community in, in Australia and you know, it's really lovely to be part of that community because obviously we've made it into the papers and the, and yeah, the television yeah. down there. Every other person wants to come and say, oh, this is so good. This is so good for Kempsey. You know, like it's, that in itself is really a rewarding sort of, you know, spin off of, of our project. That um, these people in this little country town identify with it, you know, and sort of share it, share the ride with us. So that's, yeah, that's. Corny, I know, but it's no, good. no, no. You yeah. mean you should be rightly proud. I think it's yeah. an amazing achievement. Yeah. I mean, I'd be interested to know how the original stage show, as it was, um, expanded, if that's the right word, to be the finished one that we see on screen. In terms of, it's a bit of a silly question. We need to ask is, what's the difference between the original bit, and I imagine it's yeah. a huge difference. And how did you expand it if you did well, the original show? Well, actually, we contracted it. Right. Um, when you write a school musical, you tend to create. And enough roles and situations to give as many kids a, a run, and so um, in that we, we, we've def we've definitely cut back. Um, we've um, changed a couple of the songs. Uh, a couple of the songs we thought were well, they just we knew we could do better. Um, and um, even when we got to the live rehearsals, uh, the, sorry, the rehearsals for the professional production. In the last week, I cut 22 minutes out of the script. Right. and Because um, that's quite a chunk. It's quite a chunk, but, you know, I'm not precious about it. Mm. But as you say, it's a, very, it's a really good question because, um, you know, in that, in that journey, we could see more and more, you know, little bits that we think it's just superfluous. The audience won't know if it's missing. And if it's there, it'll drag, you know. Um, we camped up rubber gloves. We didn't, um, you know, the, the slave market mm. auctioneer, who, by the way, became one of the most popular characters. Within, a, within four weeks, he had this fan club. It was incredible um, in the slave market junkie. Um, yeah, so, so there, there's been that sort of refinement along the way. And, uh, and for the next, you know, the next live production, again, I mean, I can, I can identify bits that I want to fiddle with. Well, yeah, well, I suppose the flip side, although you've cut back some bits, is there bits you actually want to add? Uh, not add so much as maybe just change a little bit, just the punchiness of the dialogue. Just there are just little, little interplays between characters where I think uh, that line would work better than that line. So, yeah, already every time I watch it, I'm thinking, yes, there's another little bit of fiddling to do. So, but um, uh, I'm just thinking, what's the, oh, what was the, there's one famous musical um, where they're all going down the mine, the mine shaft together. Um, oh, anyway, it doesn't matter, but I remember reading about it and, and they were saying that for three months of its premiere production, it was changed every week. 
Well, because they didn't quite, they weren't quite they, happy with they it. They weren't quite happy with it. Oh, jeez, I wish I could remember what it was. I don't know, not one that um, gone down a mine shaft. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. You'll doesn't think matter. of it as soon as it's finished. As soon as this is finished, yeah, yeah. So I know you were, the timing was perfect in terms of it came along the right time. Yeah. You could see that this had real potential and you were retiring and so on and so forth. So it, I, I know the time's perfect. And I know everything's a lot easier looking for in hindsight, but is it, looking back, do you wish you'd have done something like this much earlier? Or is yeah. it just, just... Yeah, yes, I do. You, you know, I know it's a hard question to ask or answer, but yeah. is that how you feel? I think so. Uh, I look... Not necessarily I, this project, but it could no. have been another musical project. Um, no, I, I do feel it, it is tiring. I'll be quite oh, honest. Yeah. It is tiring. Um, and if, like, I laugh when people say, how are you enjoying your retirement, Chris? Because Dr. Moron represents about 70 hours a week work. Yeah. Um, and I, you have to be driven by that passion. Yes, um, if I'd done it earlier, maybe it would have been maybe a bit easier. We don't know. Like, I mean, our run has been a bit of a dream run from you know, opening night of the live show to here in London now. I mean, and along the way, I mean, we've had, um, like we've had some amazing things. Like we, the, the minister assisting the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia opened our show in Canberra. And he, as soon as he walked in, he said, I want one of these T-shirts. Can I buy one of these T-shirts? And here he is, a government minister wearing a moron T-shirt to open the show, you know. Like, it's just fantasy land stuff that we've, we've experienced. So, you just, it, you know, do I have any regrets that we, start, we didn't start earlier? Not really, but I, it's the energy thing. You know, if I was younger, maybe, maybe. But then I love teaching, you know, mm. and I, I really did leave that with a great reluctance. And, and you, you often hear the, the uh, particularly people in media, you know, really go for something, you know, don't give up on the dream and all this, which mm. a lot of times I listen to and I think, I don't necessarily buy into some people saying that. I do uh, some people, but not with others. But you kind of have done that, haven't you? You've actually really pushed something that's an amazing achievement. So what would you say to people that are faltering at the edge and think, oh, should I take the risk? I would say believe in it, um, follow it, and don't give up. I mean, tenacity, as long as you've got a good product. If, yeah, you, yeah. if you believe in your product um, and other people, you know, like be willing to be thick skinned enough to take criticism from people. If you, if, you, if you know in your heart of hearts that you've got a good product, which we do with Moron, don't give up. But you have to be tenacious and disciplined to see it through. And I think that's what actually kills most really great, like a lot of good ideas that never reach fruition. It's that faltering, you yeah, know, yeah. and falling away from the target. Yeah, well, yeah. we all do. I mean, yeah. you know, we all have regrets and, yeah. you know, it, it, would be, it would have been very easy for you to put this on, going, oh, that's really great. Maybe it's got potential, but you know what? I just can't be. I can't be bothered. It's yeah. not my kind of thing. But you, obviously, yeah. you, you've taken that risk, haven't you? And it, oh, let's be honest, it's you know, it's I a know it's risk. a huge risk. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of money out there on Dr. Moron now. A lot of money, and also we're taking on an industry. And a, look, this is not a criticism of it. It is though an objective observation. We're taking on an industry that that is dominated by major theatrical producers. Yeah, and their model is recycle something that puts bums on seats. Um, we went to Motown the other night. Brilliant show, don't get me wrong. Um, we saw the Carol King, beautiful, just recently. Yeah, yeah. The Jersey Boys, fantastic shows. You They've all been around for a long time. The songs have been around for yeah, nearly 50 yeah, years. Yeah. You know, and Any one of those, actually. You know, yes. Motown, is a, he's a, you know, right. you're talking the early mid-60s, aren't you? Yeah, and I mean, I, I was surprised, um, I don't know whether I mentioned this off camera, but um, I asked my cast, in the, in the first meeting, how many of you have seen Rocky Horror? Less than half of my 35 cast have actually seen Rocky Horror. We forget Rocky Horror is, a, is probably three generations old. Oh yeah, what's that, a late, a very early 70s? Yes, that's right. Great show, I never miss a production no, of it. Brilliant. But, but the reality is, have a look out there, there's not a lot of new musicals with fresh music, you know, that, that are appealing to a broad spectrum, a broad spectrum of potential theatre goers for the future. Because mm. we're all getting older, you know, like, and you know, like the, the Carol King fans, you know, um, and the Jersey boy, you know, we, we are getting older and you really need to keep this industry alive by providing new, really new, exciting stuff. Definitely. Like, like more of. Definitely. I mean, even if you look at something like 
which seemed very very modern to me oh, no, um, Mamma Mia yeah. and Wicked actually they've been around for a few years that's now, right they? that's right we forget that music is sort of locked into our younger days yeah yeah that's right yeah it's a bit of a scary thought I know but um, but that's a, that's the thing with Moron where we really hope we get the the people the investors to say hey this is this is for now you know this is a brand new rock musical for now and um, yeah, fingers crossed Chris brilliant yeah thank you very thanks, much Steve he's coming Moron he's coming oh god if a monster are you Dr Moron the worst kind there is my team he has seen but half the universe who has never been shown the house of pain. No, no. If you think of what I'm thinking! You just tell me what to think and I'll think it right away, you black magic woman, you! Y'all ready to get down like your backs ain't got no bone? Revival music! Let's get this slave market thing happening before I gnaw through my gloves with excitement. <laughs> What's wrong with you two? Nothing's wrong with us. <laughs> Hating. Loving. Wanting. Taking! We thought this lady might help us! <laughs> he is terror. He is horror. He is the four horse with the apocalypse. Dr. Mora. Don't miss it. Hey, I'm a road and a rule, okay? Moron, moron, <laughs> he is a moron.